Like the eternal city that is Rome, where the ecclesiastical splendor of the Renaissance completely enthralls the imagination. The dome of St. Peter's rises upwards like a heavenly choir. From the topmost pinnacle, the centuries that are Rome spread out in everlasting significance. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so today we have on Charles A. Colum, as well as three other Englishmen and another American, James. Um, so yeah, as I, should I say good afternoon? Um, what time is it in England? It's currently 7 p.m., so not bad. It's yeah. 8 p.m. here in Austria. Oh, you're in Austria. How did you end up there? Going to school at the International Theological Institute. I'm about to graduate in June. Never too late for some schooling. That's for sure. <laughs> Getting my master's in sacred theology. I can't recommend the program here highly enough. Yeah. Um, Good I think we're all in college except me. Um, I'm the only one not in college anymore. So basically, you're the working stiff, and you're surrounded by a bunch of college kids. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surrounded by a bunch of monks. Um, I work at the Abbey of Gethsemane, so the oldest uh, operating monastery in America. Um, that it is. So that I go is. from monks to college kid. <laughs> well, well, you, uh, do we introduce you to everyone? Or should we? Well, the that's true. Neva is actually, uh, we would say he's just a high school lad. Yes. Yeah, I mean. I always thought uh, Neva was like 25 or something. He's really mature looking and mature, but. He's half Gorka. They look that way from about age six until they die. <laughs> it's, you know, it's just the way it is. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. But I'll start us out on a topic here. So we have. This will be a good topic starter. So, King Charles the Third. Um, any thoughts on him, Mister Clum? Would you like to go first? Well, sure. Uh, you know, there's there is a whole industry out there. Uh, actually, first kickstarted by the uh, inimitable Rupert Murdoch, that looks to find and put the worst construction on everything about the man. And I know because I've been watching it for thirty years. Despite being a mere college kid, I'm older than I look. <laughs> um, and the truth is, you know, as I, as I tell people, there's some things like climate change and population and all that that I really disagree with him on. But of course, he shares the superstitions of our entire ruling class, including the Holy Father. But he's better than the vast majority of creatures that I've ever uh, been given to vote for. And I would add to it, that he, um, he's, how do I put this, in his autobiography, not autobiography, but the authorized biography by Jonathan Dimbleby, he attacks Henry VIII for breaking from Rome, which is something you don't hear too often. Uh, and I've seen and applauded his efforts down through the last decades in defense of decent architecture, decent education, um, all sorts of good stuff that our rulership loathe and abominate. So that's the one thing. I mean, he's, he is what he is. He's a product of his time. One of the things I also should point out is that people like to call him a syncretist because he's always talking about uh, being a defender of faith and so on. But what has to be borne in mind, especially by younger people, is that those of us who are Cold War babies, like him, were brought up with the idea that the struggle in the world was between believers and unbelievers. Mm. When we were young, between communists and capitalists. And so I think that very much forms a great deal of his frame of reference, especially given the fact that it's the atheists who are in control in most, uh, most countries, including his own. <laughs> so yeah. the, what looks like syncretism to some, I think you could just as well see an attempt to build bridges with potential allies. But having said all of that, there's one other point I would make about him 
which I think is very, very, very fascinating and may give a key to his character. There are two points, really. One is that he's a great admirer of George III, which the uninstructed American sounds horrible. But if you actually know anything about George III, it speaks very well for him. The second, however, is that for many years, we were told he was going to call himself George VII after his grandfather, because the name Charles III carried with it all sorts of unpleasant Catholic and Jacobite and Stuart overtones. Charles I, of course, being the man murdered for uh, defending church and state from the odious Oliver Cromwell, not that we're biased. Charles II being the merry monarch who uh, died, who converted to Catholicism on his deathbed. And of course, uh, to my way of thinking, the real Charles III <laughs> being Bonnie Prince Charlie. Uh, I would have loved it if he'd taken the name Charles IV, but I think that would have been a bridge too far. <laughs> Just one step beyond. Uh, at any rate, all that having been said, there are a couple of other things before I forget to toss into the mix. One is that the coronation rite he's about to undergo, mm. with the exception of the oath and the fact that it was translated into English, is very much the same as that of his medieval predecessors. It's almost exactly the same, except for the oath, as the coronation of the last English king, James II, in 1685. It has one other resemblance to that occurrence, and that other resemblance is that the chrism with which you will be anointed will, for the first time since 1685, have mm. been consecrated by a, by a bishop in indisputable apostolic orders. Mm. Mm. And if one is a Catholic, one can't help but hope and think and pray that that will be a means of, of grace of some kind for the new king. The mm. other interesting thing, too, is that, as you may or may not recall, Pope Francis gave him some relics of the true cross. Mm -hmm. What he did with those was he had them made into a processional cross called the Cross of Wales, uh, mm. which will now be a part of the British regalia. Unlike a lot of other European crown jewels, uh, I don't think the British set, except well, maybe before the, the crown was destroyed, but they never had a processional cross as part of the regalia, and now they do, equipped with mm. relics of the true cross. And that yeah. reflects the king's views. Mm. Just like if you saw his uh, Christmas message, he did something I thought that was rather interesting. He uh, had a, a clip of himself by the Grotto of the Nativity, where our Lord was born uh, in Bethlehem. And he refers to him as our, where our Lord Jesus Christ was born, according to the Holy Scripture, which... Mm. There are very few people in public life, I can imagine, doing that. At the same time, in the same speech, he did his best to uh, reach out to the majority of his subjects who are not Christian. So putting it all together, my guess, my hope, my prayer is that uh, just as when he was Prince of Wales, he, in his own words, tried to roll back some of the, more, some of the worst excesses of the 1960s. Mm. I hope that he will be something of a more activist monarch than we've uh, seen in the past, Rain. Mm. Yeah, I, I was going to uh, bring up the Christmas message because I I was very, very pleasantly surprised on Christmas Day to sit and hear a message so refreshing. And especially in public life, it doesn't matter whether you're an Englishman or whether you're an American, whether you're from Sweden or Denmark, no matter where you may be from, to hear an authentically Christian message. I know it's I know it sounds crazy to think that it's rare to have a Christian <laughs> message on Christmas Day, but really to hear what was a genuinely beautiful speech by His Majesty the King was such a beautiful and refreshing thing. Uh, as Charles said, our Lord Jesus Christ, that's exactly the words he used. And at the end of his message, it was something he, he mentioned along the lines of, um, and may your, your, uh, your Christmas be filled with that eternal light, refer referring to O Little Town of Bethlehem, the hymn which was included at the end of his Christmas message. I thought it was such a incredible thing. And I think what was most important 
about that is that that was the first major speech of his reign. And I truly believe that he used that Christmas message to set out exactly what he wants to achieve and what he wants to build his reign around. And that is our Lord Jesus Christ. So I was very pleasantly surprised and very, very happy to hear his majesty's Christmas message. And I, I'm certain that that same message of our Lord Jesus Christ becoming man for us and being born in a manger will be replicated for years to come and long may he reign. Mm. Uh, to echo that, really, uh, I suppose uh, what Mr. Colomb said, uh, in democracy, to quote Joseph the Mest, in a democracy, people get leaders they deserve. Now, now we've seen in the modern era that, of course, England is a much more progressive, much more liberal country. However, in times like these, we've had leaders, specific leaders as well, who've, who, who can really influence the situation. And Prince Charles, now King Charles, his majesty, he's really executed that. And I think he's, he's specifically chosen Charles for a reason, of course. And he wants to show to the people that he's willing to take those steps that might upset the establishment, really, the political establishment. He wants to do something which his, his mother, unfortunately, couldn't really do. Actually, I'm pretty sure, Mr. Yourself, Charles, you posted on your Instagram, uh, of the Latin Mass Society doing a recent uh, a talk about Her Majesty and whether or not she could have vetoed certain mm. heretical laws. I think that would be a very good listen for our viewers if that is recorded. But to get back on point, I think what Calder said when he mentioned our law, it's rare. I mean, in this day and age, of course, secular politicians and even Christian monarchs in Europe, they have failed to represent Christ style king. However, now, especially with his first speech, being that representing and recognizing that Christ is Lord and the Pope giving him a relic from the cross, that just really shows for us that good times are ahead. And all we can do is prayer and support our monarchy in such mm. dark times. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> Um, do the four of y'all have high hopes for Britain becoming a Catholic country again <laughs> sometime in the future? Well, I, long, uh, well, Calder has got he did an article on it actually. Do you want to talk about it, Calder? I, 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 I had written something about this uh, before. Um, it was more about the Church of England becoming Catholic rather than the nation uh, itself, because I think. Uh, like all of the Western world, uh, this is not an exclusively English problem. Uh, we have a crisis of faith. And it isn't just faith in the sense of, I am a Roman Catholic, but faith in the sense of, is there a God? Is there a higher being? There is a loss of um, belief in there being something bigger than oneself. So it is, uh, it's truly a very difficult and dire time that we live in. But as we have, uh, as we have seen, uh, well, for example, myself and Charles belong to the personal and ordinariate. We have seen great fruits uh, within the church when it, when it comes to Anglicans entering full communion with the Catholic Church. We have seen plenty of bishops, plenty of Anglican uh, you know, so-called theologians, plenty of priests, uh, entering into Holy Mother Church and recognizing that one must be united under the Holy See, uh, especially in times like this, we see the Anglican Church more than ever, it's evidence that they have lost the faith, if they hadn't already, of course, I mean, <laughs> but, um, but, but yes, England becoming a Catholic nation again, uh, Someone asked me a question like this recently, and what I said to them is, I'm glad I don't know the answer, because if I knew the answer, I would be God. And I really think that, um, I really think it's a question that no one can, you know, like I said, uh, perhaps hyperbolically, no one can really give an honest answer to that, because we live in such difficult times 
that will there be a true restoration of Christianity in England? I, I, I pray so. I hope so. I, I, I believe that, especially after the crisis of COVID-19, where many people were very depressed and there was a crisis of people struggling mentally, people very much came back to God. In this time of need, they recognized that there was a loving father there who would hold his children in his arms and a blessed mother who would do the same. So I, I, I believe that there will be truly a restoration of Christianity in this country. But when is a good question. Uh, I, I certainly do not think that the Anglicans are doing themselves any favours. Uh, you see the way that they're going with their recent synods and GAFCON, uh, for the viewers that may not know, the Global Anglican Conference for more traditional Anglicans, quote-unquote, they have, uh, in essence, separated themselves from Canterbury at this moment in time. So the Anglican Church is really not doing itself a favour if it has any sort of um, wish to make this country Christian again. But, well, I mean, I doubt they actually do have that wish, to be perfectly honest with you. But, yes, um, I believe Charles wants to speak, so I'll pass over to Mr. Cologne. Thank you. Uh Oh, well, a number of things come to mind. I mean, I agree with you, of course. And I also believe that it's not simply a question of England, but of the entire Anglosphere. Mm. As England goes, so go the rest of us. Mm -hmm. uh, I would recommend very highly two books by my favorite living theologian, uh, Father Aidan Nichols. Uh, one of them is called Christendom Awake. The other is called The Realm. Uh, which is specifically about the conversion of England. Now, a couple of things that are important to bear in mind is that one advantage that England has over us, and I do believe it's an advantage, we see this with the monarchy, but not just with the monarchy. You see it in every element of life, from the Lord's hmm. Lieutenant and the Sheriff's to uh, the Lord Mayor's show and the, uh, the livery companies and the guilds in different towns. You have the desiccated remains of a Catholic order, oh, the bones certainly. of old England, mm. which and and Scotland and actually in, in weirdly Ireland, they are. You have the remnants of bits and pieces, in a way that my country does not. And so the real question, the the difference between the 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 conversion of England and the conversion of Scotland and Ireland, versus the conversion of America is that in America, it's building something from whole cloth. Mm. In England and the rest of the, uh, the British Isles, it's a question of, can these bones live? Mm. Mm. And the truth is, it is easier to bring something back to life than to create completely new. Uh, now, having said that, you also have to have a Catholic church with its leadership that are evangelistically minded. Mm. Now, Pope Benedict XVI told us way back in 2016 that the big problem with the church at the moment is that the vast majority of Catholics are universalists. And they do not believe that you need the church or her sacraments, and certainly not her priesthood, for salvation. In fact, they don't believe you need Christ for salvation, which is, of mm. course, the only reason why you would need the church or the sacraments of the priesthood, is because that's simply the concrete application of Christ's mission and merits to the individual. Mm -hmm. And as a result, said Benedict, and I agree with him, um, not only do you lose any desire to evangelize, which we have lost, you lose any reason to stay Catholic. But I'll defer to Henry because I've said what I want and he's got his hand up. Thank you, Mr. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Coulomb. To add on to what you said about the conversion of America, definitely that is one of the big one of the big disadvantages that we have is that we don't really have much of a Catholic order to be to you know build upon. We have the you know, the bare minimum that was left by the French, the Spanish and the English in Maryland. And that's it's so little that you can't and the fact that it's all been almost completely erased that you know, the remnants of that is so small 
it's going to be very difficult to sort of, you know, build off of that. And so definitely, you know, looking back to those sort to, you know, those, um, you know, pre-revolutionary um, settlements in our country is definitely a, a good way to go when it comes to building a Catholic country. However, we're, we're going to have to build more, like, we're going to have to build more than just that, considering the fact that we have so little. And, and you know, if I want to be, you know, if I'm going to be an optimist here, I think that when it comes to other, um, you know, other denominations in this country, I think that definitely the, you know, Catholicism is definitely on the rise in, in, in America. Um, for when you compare it to like the Episcopalians, for example, they're in complete, they're in complete decline. I mean, I'm pretty sure the average uh, Episcopalian is like in their early 60s or something, if not older than that. And, mm -hmm. and yeah. yeah, so um, I, I hope you're not suggesting there's anything wrong with being in your early 60s. <laughs> no, of course not. Of course not. Of course not. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> and you also have, you know, you also have many newly created thriving communities, like Catholic communities across the country. Um, you have, like, for example, Ave Maria down here in Florida. Um, you also have, like, St. Mary's up in Kansas and mm. many other wonderful places that are also, you know, starting up i'm pretty sure the saint joseph shrine up in detroit i think they're i think they're up in detroit if anyone knows uh please correct me um i think they're also planning on you know building sort of a residential area for catholics nearby the the parish so it's very clear that yeah you know you have community like you know newly thriving catholic community across the country and definitely um the you know the status of the church, like, you know, the state of the church in the country is in a, we're, we could, we're in a very good position. It's really just a matter of how our bishops and our priests decide in, you know, what direction they decide to take that. And, you know, as Benedict XVI pointed out, pointed out is that, you know, um, people, a lot of Catholics sadly don't, you know, see a need in the sacraments and, you know, God as well. And, Sadly, that has been the attitude for of American Catholics for a long time, which I believe you've actually pointed that out, Mr. Coulomb, that the, you know, for the, ever since the American church was established, it's been more focused on, you know, coexisting with everyone else rather than evangelizing. So. It's it's true, and that, that brings us back to the conversion of England, because I cannot help but think, uh, and mind you, this is not something I expect to see in my time, but... We have to remember that just as Rome, it, it took over 300 years, almost 400, to convert the Roman Empire. And that mm. was when you had all sorts of saints and martyrs doing it, you know, as opposed to people, well, like us. Um, the, uh, the fact is, we have to be ready for the long haul. Bearing in mind, of course, that our individual salvation is part of that story, and vice versa, that story is part of our individual salvation, if you see what I mean. Um, but I can't help but think that in the United States, in Anglo-Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Anglo-South Africa, and India, even uh, elsewhere, the British Isles returning to the faith would be an incredible victory for Christ. Mm. Now, and I, I also believe mm. that sooner or later we will have a, uh, a hierarchy in Rome and across the, the globe that are keen on evangelization. Uh, I look at the young priests today. You know, one thing you've got to bear in mind is that the leadership today are the young priests of my childhood. Mm. And the less I say about them in a live feed, the better. <laughs> uh, suffice it to say that they put us where we are. Mm. Mm. Now, having said that, you know, like... <laughs> My generation, I like to say, we, we boomers are the only generation I know of that grew old without ever growing up. But it's, it's you know, got to take what you can. But uh, truly, in your, by the time you're my age, I would be extremely surprised if, at least in terms of the church, uh, things were a lot better. 
I would be very surprised. I would, mm. I'd be very surprised if they were not a lot better. Now, that's no guarantee as to what the state will be like. And it might well be that persecution by the state is one of the things that contributes to the church becoming a lot better. Um, we can't tell. We don't. Uh, we're not given the future to know. So, but uh, I, you know, lads like yourselves, uh, if you'll excuse me, uh, calling you lads, um, give me a great deal of hope for the future. Um, you don't have the illusions that my generation had at your age. You know, mm. when I was your age, uh, Ronald Reagan was the president and uh, John Paul II was the pope and communism was the great enemy. Mm. About the only thing that remained the same until last year was the queen. <laughs> 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 Everything else changed. God rest his soul. So she was our, uh, I'll, I'll have you know, this is apropos of nothing, but I got the news about the Queen's death when I was in Cluj, Romania. I had just come down mm. from Ukraine, and uh, I was there with a couple of friends in the uh, uh, in a restaurant having dinner. <clears throat> when we finished eating, we went out to the to the main square in Cluj and said, God save the king. So <laughs> it's the first time I've ever done, uh, done that. So... Mm. So you mentioned uh, that was three. a surreal moment. Oof. Oh yeah, finish finish your thought, Carl. If you have a no, I, I remember uh, the day that Her Majesty passed away, and I I remember the first time that I sung "God Save the King" because it never, when Her Majesty passed, it never occurred to me, or or it, my first thought, I should say, was not we have a new national anthem now. And the uniforms of our soldiers will change and the crests on the Tower of London and so on and so forth. But I remember watching the funeral of Her Late Majesty and God Save the King. And at that moment, it occurred to me, this is a new, this is, this is, we are now in a new age, the age of His Majesty King Charles III. And it was a surreal, surreal moment. It, it really was. I thought I'd just say that here and i'm sure niwa felt the same it was really one of those well, kind of moments you from an american perspective it's, it's it's one of those things where i don't talk to people from england that much so it still kind of slips my mind every now and again that we've changed it like i was getting chills mm. as you were explaining the point of like we're in a new age of his majesty yes mm. you know the king and i was sort of like yeah. man I, I just keep forgetting to an extent that you know it's because yes, yes. it's because it's not a part of my day-to-day -day life i mean I think that was it's, the only it's... piece of news that I talked about with total strangers in my entire yes, life. Yes, yes. Felt like everything in the world was different afterwards. Her uh, Majesty, and I suppose the British monarch, for a long time has been a unifying figure throughout the entire Anglosphere, and this is why so many Americans are so interested in the life of the of the British monarchy. I think it is somewhat of a longing for the traditions that we Englishmen are so very lucky to have. I think there certainly is a longing for those, even if it's just the traditions of state openings of parliament and state funerals, because of course the Americans have, I don't know whether the term for them are state funerals, but there are we, we, to yeah, the light. We call them that. They're called state yes. funerals. The, the and pageantry and the tradition is just so... Well, very the thing, difference the thing is is that we we try to create the tradition in a way that just ends up not working i mean one example of this i i saw a commentator that was talking about the state of the union address from a ways back um and talking about the bizarre pretense towards civility that seems to override a significant proportion of american politics and he kind of made the point of saying that he thinks that's part of the reason that there are so many people that don't see how nakedly terrible the government has become because mm. part of American culture is not necessarily an implicit respect for politicians because we have, you know, the same distrust of them that you have in most places, but there is this almost effort to at least lend the office of the presidency or the concept of certain political offices in an amount of decorum and respect that, that seems more yes. fitting far more traditional institutions that are held, you know, not by elected officials that are pursuing mm. their own ends, but rather by, something like a monarch. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think um, 
one of the things that's forgotten is that the American Revolution had a huge effect on Britain as well as America. Mm. It wasn't all one way. Uh, Eric Nelson, in his book, The Royalist Revolution, ends it by saying that after the smoke of the, the war and the Constitution's framing had cleared, on one side of the water, you had a monarchy without a king, and on the other, a king without a monarchy. And that, I'm afraid, is, is really where we ended up, because regardless of the ins and outs, George III's attempts to reform the British uh, Constitution, which for him was not going back to 1688, contrary to rumor, but to 1708, to Queen Anne, who was, uh, he wanted to restore the monarch to that position. Uh, and was frustrated in doing so because of the outcome of the revolution. Uh, it really, it established the United States in the weird sort of, uh, we're not a monarchy, we're a republic, but we're a republican monarchy, we're a monarchical republic, but we're, that we do. Contrary wise, for Britain, it began the creation of a long wedge, which you now see at every level of British governance. So you've got the king, the prime minister, the House of Lords, the House of Commons, uh, the sheriff and the Lord Lieutenant of the county, the chairman mm -hmm. of the county council, the, mm -hmm. the Lord Mayor, the Mayor, the Lord Provost, the chairman of the city of the town council. So you have this, this radical division between the, if you will, ceremonial and, so they say, effective elements yes. of government, yes. which, of course, is actually alien to the British tradition. One of the great ironies is that in certain ways in the United States, we preserved elements of British governance in a much more traditional way than Britain has. So in most states, our sheriffs, for instance, have the powers that sheriffs had in the Middle Ages in uh, the English hmm. counties. You've heard, I'm sure, if you've watched an old Western, that, yeah, <laughs> I'm being attacked for my sins. Yes, Star Spangled Crown. <laughs> but the the uh, you you've heard of the westerns, the posse. Mm -hmm. Well, that mm -hmm. was short for the uh, posse comitatus, the power of the county, which was still in British law until the 1830s. The last time a, a, an English sheriff raised a posse was in 1834, and it was mm -hmm. to deal with some riots in Oxfordshire. But since that time, it's become a totally ceremonial office. And you've basically got Inspector Morse in the Thames Valley Constabulary <laughs> doing that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, if you don't mind me interjecting, actually, this, this all links back to the framework that Britain has to become much more a Catholic country than America, of course. I think echoed earlier by uh, Henry and Charles, uh, Britain already has the foundation. We have the bones already. America doesn't have the bones. So it's a matter of whether or not we can sort of resurrect those Catholic bones. I know, for a starter, we can take the analogy from you know, Archbishop Schneider. Uh, Archbishop Schneider was talking about the Novus Order and the Latin Mass. If the Novus Order was, were to be suddenly replaced by the Latin Mass, that would cause confusion, of course. That would be a massive blow to the Catholic Church. So what Archbishop Schneider is talking about here is, is that you need to slowly but steadily, steadily transition yourself to that Latin Mass stage, if there was, of course, that transition of the order to Latin Mass. So you'd first need to change some of the prayer languages, of course. You would need to change some of the formulations of the consecrations back to its uh, back to its prior state and Arch, I think 100% if we were, if England were to convert to a Catholic nation, it would need to, up, it would need to uphold those principles of slowly but steadily transitioning to uh, a traditional Roman Catholic state. We've seen this for example with the ordinariate of course uh, Benedict XVI of course gave those provisions for Anglicans to slowly but steadily come to the Roman Catholic Church Mm -hmm. I believe mm -hmm. I met um, the, the priest in St. Joseph. He, he's in Oldershaw. He's a Latin mass priest called Father Anthony Glacier. And he was an Anglican seminary. But he was one of those Anglo-Papalists. 
one of those weird ones. But he realized all of a sudden that, you know, maybe I'm incorrect. Maybe let me just see what goes on in this Roman Catholic church. And then he did his research and he came to the conclusion that the Holy See, the Roman Catholic Church, is entirely correct. So it's slow steady transition. I mean, back then he was probably some random normal, your average Anglican seminary. But slowly but steadily he came to accept those traditions. And this sort of links back to the intricacies that certain foreigners love about England. Oh, they see the opening of Parliament, of course. They see the King's Speech, or formerly known for like 60 years, the Queen's Speech. They mm -hmm. see the House of Lords, Lord Temporals, the Lord Spirituals, how they debate. It's, lots of people outside love those intricacies. And once they find out why they're there, why in a de jure manner they're there, they'll get to the fact of reasons into why they want it, of course. Like Charles was rightfully mentioning, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and it... it uh... It's a good thing to remember, too, that if, as and when, you have a Catholic king, after the uh, constitutional crisis has passed, <laughs> um, oh, and there will be a constitutional crisis. Oh, yeah, oh, certainly. Mm. <laughs> without, without any, any yes, doubt. Yes. But after it's passed, um, I can tell you that that, ironically, would be the biggest blow for the faith in American history. Mm -hmm. uh, in certainly, well, I won't be around, but in my time, um, and it would it will force not just every Englishman, every Scotsman, every Irishman, every Welshman to re-examine who and what they are religiously. It will force every American, every Anglo-Canadian, mm -hmm. every uh, Australian, New Zealander, and Anglo-South African uh, to again ask themselves, what is it to be an Anglo? And I speak as one who's not. Uh, it will. It will be a tremendous thing, and I, uh, you know, I suspect it will happen. Edward the Seventh, you know, came into the church on his deathbed. Um, I, I doubt highly that Charles would ever. I mean, I, I don't think he's a crypto Catholic at this stage in his life. But I would not be horribly surprised if it happened. Hmm. Uh, I would not be surprised if he converted on his deathbed. And if that happened, and if it were public, that would be extraordinary. There's, a, so there's a, an old legend that uh, is passed around in parts of New England. I don't know if it's true or not, but it uh, claims that George Washington actually converted on his deathbed. Because um, before he died, he there was no there was no minister of the Church of England present, but he did apparently have a prolonged meeting with a friend of his who had been a Catholic priest, who apparently dashed off a letter in secrecy as soon as he returned back to his abode from his meeting with General Washington. Mm. As one of those things, mm? There's a. It was John Neal who was supposed like, to have done that. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I hope for Washington's like, sake it's true. <laughs> I hope so as well. That would that would there's certainly also, be the they also talk about surprise now. of arriving in heaven. I was like, oh, General Washington's here. That's <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, his purgatory doubtless will be watching the uh, George Washington National Masonic Memorial. <laughs> <laughs> but it, uh, you know, and, and there you've got another interesting thing about the king. Unlike Edward VIII and George VI and George V, he is not a Freemason. Mm. Mm. That's a big, right. big, big thing. That is actually very mm. And that, very. It's, uh, that's why the Duke of Kent is stuck with the job. Mm. And his <laughs> wife's a convert. So it all makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> sense I, mean. I think this is a good time if we can segue now to the American Revolution. I know Henry's quite eager for yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Do you have a starter for us, Henry? Yeah. I can uh, think of one. Well, um, you can start off with. We're going to talk about the um, the relation between monarchy and the American Revolution. Um, I think Mr. Coulomb actually. I think he made a video, like he did a speak a uh, little speech for uh, a talk for Census Fidelium a long time ago, 
where he talked about um, different dissenters throughout American history. And he taught, he goes into detail about how the origins of the American Revolution um, weren't with like the tea tax and et cetera, et cetera. But rather, it was a multi generational conflict, which can argue, which arguably started with the War of the Roses. So then, how it just naturally progressed from there. If you know, Mr. Colon, you could elaborate more on that. Well, it's it's not a theory peculiar to me, uh, and I recommend a book by uh, Kevin Phillips called the Bro the uh, Cousins Wars. But basically. Um, the Anglosphere has been torn by several major conflicts, which had the effect of turning us from a little island on the edge of Europe into the uh, filth-peddling colossus we are today. I mean that in a nice way, of course. Um, the, uh, being Having lived in California most of my life, I'm incapable of meaning anything except in a nice way. Just have to get that established first. Uh, I, the War of the Roses is a good thing to mention simply because, unwittingly, the parties in the, War of the, in the Wars of the Roses played a role in the uh, struggles around the uh, Protestant Revolt in England. And that seems a little bit odd. But basically, if you recall, the House of Plantagenet, the main line died out, uh, and there were two more or less equally situated cadet branches. The House of York, the White Rose, the House of Lancaster, the Red Rose. And these eventually went into civil war. The last of the Lancasters, the servant of God, Henry VI, uh, founder of Eton and King's College, Cambridge. I'm sure he'd be horrified to see what happened to them in the time since. But that's true of an awful lot of founders, as City Nations <laughs> Loyola could probably tell you. But at any rate, um, the uh, I, I, see, I try to be nice. Anyway, Henry the Sixth uh, died, and the uh, Edward the Fourth came to the throne. Uh, he died, and his brother Richard became Richard the Third, as we know. Who, apart from only lasting two years and dying at Bosworth Field uh, at the hands of Henry the Seventh, he was actually the one who began looking in to Henry the Sixth, his family's opponent, as a mm. saint. Which is kind of strange if you think yes, about it. Yes. And the only the only the only thing you can say is on the one hand we know that Richard the Third was personally pious, and on the other, he really must have thought Henry was in fact a saint. Mm. Which given the situation must have been very, very peculiar. But at any rate, uh, go forward a couple of generations, and you have a situation where when Henry VIII breaks with Rome, the descendants of the Lancastrian party tend to support the king, and the descendants of the Yorkists tend to oppose him. Hmm. Now, you have to say tend, Not because mistaken, you find Mr. exceptions. Cleon. I'm sorry. If I'm not mistaken, Mr. Colum. The current, I'm pretty sure, one of the um, few descendants of the House of Plantagenet today is still Catholic, and he was from the Yorkist branch. If I'm not mistaken, I'm I'm no doubt. And they, I mean, uh, Saint or uh, Blessed Margaret Pole, the Countess of Salisbury, had a better claim to the throne than Henry did, and that and her refusal to uh, to break with Rome ended up in her being uh, attainted for treason and executed at the tower. But she was kind of a tough lady. And when she was let in to the room with the chopping block, she pulled free of her, uh, her guards and said, if you want my head, Sir Headsman, you must come and get it. And so he ended up having to chase her all around the room, whacking away at her with the ax. It was really a mess. But at any rate, uh, she was a York descendant. At any rate, so you have the, um, you then have the struggles of the Protestant revolt, the pilgrimage of grace, the rising mm. in the north in or the, in the west in 1549, the rising in the north in 1569, <clears throat> the Marian interlude, all that stuff goes on. And meanwhile, England is slowly being drained of the Catholic faith. Every time there's a struggle, fewer and fewer English, Scots, and Irish are Catholic. 
Well, then uh, you, you've got the um, one of the other things Henry VIII did unwittingly was create what became the Whig oligarchy by his distribution of monastic lands. And it's mm. no, no um, uh, coincidence that Thomas Cromwell, his aide in destroying the monasteries, had a great nephew named Oliver Cromwell, who was the murderer of King Charles I. Mm. And of course, in the what we call the English Civil War and what today are called the Wars of the Three Kingdoms, which has a delightfully Tolkien-esque sound to it, yeah. uh, that featured virtually every Catholic in the, uh, in the Three Kingdoms fighting for King Charles against Cromwell. Mm. Yes, sir. If I'm not mistaken, this is also probably the first of the first of the conflicts of the Anglosphere that we Americans participated in. Because if I'm not Correct. mistaken, uh, Virginia tried to declare Charles II king after not long after Charles I was executed. Meanwhile, the Puritans up in New England were more sympathetic to Cromwell, and uh, I believe the Catholics in Maryland also fought against the Roundheads as well. All true, and in fact, the last battle of the Wars of the Three Kingdoms was fought in 1652 in Maryland, the Battle of Severn Creek. So, uh, and interest, to make up for it, of course, the last battle of the American Revolution was fought in India. So, you know, it, it, there is compensation in life. So, anyway, so you have the Civil War, then you have the Restoration, and then the so-called Glorious Revolution, oh. wherein uh, Charles II's brother, the last Catholic king, is overthrown. And then from that, the Jacobite Wars in Ireland, and then the Three Risings in Scotland. And by the time it's all over, in 1746, Catholicism is at a very low ebb in the British Isles. And I believe that, if I'm not mistaken, I believe Hilaire Belloc in his book, Charles I, um, goes into big detail about how the it's the definition of what exactly who was Catholic during this time was a very you know was very complicated in a sense because like and he goes into great detail about like well if we include these categorizations then there's a lot of people in England who were Catholic sympathies however if we go by the very strict definition then almost no one was Catholic like and he goes on and it's... on about that. It was. It's a moving target, and it's interesting. For instance, that Charles the uh, First, in order to try to Catholicize the C of E, uh, he appointed a gentleman called William Laud as Archbishop of Canterbury. Now Laud was far from pro-Roman, although he was a Catholicizer. Nevertheless, twice the Pope offered him the red hat. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, Anglican orders had not been ruled on at that point. And the, un the unspoken, unmentioned thing about that little adventure, Law or, uh, Laud laughingly refused it both times. But the offer could not have been made without the permission of the king. And so it seems to me, especially because of the various letters he wrote to various popes through his reign, Charles I was actually rather keen on reunion with Rome. And this was one of the things that came up in his so-called trial, which has led me to question whether or not he might be called the proto-martyr of the ordinariate. <laughs> <laughs> I know, uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken as well, uh, during the English Civil War, the, the original archbishops of Ireland at the time, they met. Uh, they met the king. This was famously a dramatic, uh, well, made into a drama uh, during the movie Cromwell, when he tried to get Irish troops to fight for the royalists, of course. And then, of course, they found out, and they that became a massive uh, trial issue uh, during the illegitimate trial of His Majesty. No. Henry. Oh, yes. I also wanted to point out um, that during the trial of during his illegitimate trial, um, Charles I never actually denied that he was trying to 
um, bring about reunification with Rome. No matter, like, in, you can go through it. Like, you can not find a single piece of evidence where he denied that he was a papist. It's true. And that uh, might have contributed to his saving his life. He also insisted on retaining bishops in the C of E, which, if, had he been willing to go along with that, they'd have uh, spared him. But, uh, you know, after the, after the whole Jacobite thing, in a certain sense, the sphere of interest switches. As I mentioned earlier, you have George III uh, wanting to restore the status quo under Queen Anne. And then you have the American Revolution, which was fought. It was really and truly a civil war, political in England, military in, in the colonies. But these two struggles were intimately connected. And the proof of the pudding is that Sir William Howe, the uh, British commander in New York, well, actually in, in the United States, uh, was lost Henry. Uh, oh, no. He... Um, Hopefully, Sir he'll William return. Howe. Yeah. What's what? Continue. Uh, Sir William yeah. threw his part of the war three times to let Washington escape, and then when uh, he went, he retired after muffing the attempt to uh, uh, in 1778 to bring the three armies together in Albany. When Burgoyne came down from Canada and Saint Leger came to the Mohawk Valley, Howe instead of going up the Hudson went out for conquered Philadelphia. So that ended up with Burgoyne being defeated and France and Spain coming into the war. So his conduct was considered somewhat scandalous back home. He goes, he retires, he goes back to England, he faces the Parliamentary Board of Enquiry. And they ask him, why did you let Washington get away three times? And why did you basically muff the 1778 strategy? And his response was, the answer to that question is political. And I choose not to give it. And then he resumed his, his seat in Parliament and voted against the king consistently. So the political struggle in England and the military struggle in the colonies were part of the same civil war. And when it was over, as Nelson says, you had the monarchy without a king with us, the king without a monarchy with Britain. Mm. And then the, the last of these struggles, according to Phillips and other authorities, was, of course, our own American civil war. But notice each time the opposition has become less and less Catholic. Yeah. So when you come finally to the American Civil War, uh, you have an interesting paradox whereby there are many more American or uh, Catholics in the North, but they count for nothing politically. There are a lot fewer in the South. But they're much more influential because they're wealthier and they're they're, they're in Louisiana. They're they're in uh, the coastal cities. They've got money. Um, and one of the interesting things in American historiography ever since is been the attempt to try to explain the difference between North and South. The obvious, of course, slave and free. But you'll see, well, the the Puritan North and the Anglican South, the English North and the Celtic South. The you know, and they're all true to a degree. These all of these uh, different, uh, you know, the industrial banking north versus the agricultural south. All of these reasons for trying to explain the fight mm. have a certain amount of truth to them. Uh, but any one of them by itself is kind of misleading. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, when the South was defeated. That was the end of the Cousins Wars and the establishment of, of the status quo we have now. Mm. And one of the things that Phillips points out is that in Britain, both during our revolution and our civil war, the areas that most supported the, uh, the war against the rebellion in 1776 and the Southern Rebellion in, in 1860 were the areas that had been Cavalier and Jacobite. They tended to be in, in England and Scotland, and vice versa. Henry? Might I add, because um, we we briefly went through the, the Jacobite Wars here, um, might I add as well, if I'm not mistaken as well, 
not only did we also participate in the War of the Three Kingdoms, but we also participated in the Jacobite Wars, if I'm not mistaken, in Mar in Maryland as well. Uh, it was called the, I think in Maryland it's called the Protestant Revolution. Yes, uh, we did indeed, uh, and also in uh, New York and New England, where James II had united the New England colonies and uh, New York into what was called the Dominion of New England, and he appointed Sir Edmund Andros as governor because he felt that these little colonies would not really do well by themselves for self-defense and so on. And Andros was overthrown when the news came of the uh, of the uh, rebellion in England. Uh, another interesting factoid, just I'll just toss it out there for whatever it might be worth. A lot of the areas that were loyalists in the 13 colonies and, and studying who the loyalists were is a fascinating thing. But many of them came from areas that were sort of neglected, rural places outside the center of things. Um, fade in, fade out, four score and seven years later, with the American uh, Civil War, the Second Civil War, the war between the states is being fought. The areas of the 13 original states in the north that had been loyalist tended to be Copperhead. But the areas of the 13 original states that had been loyalist in the south tended to be Unionist. And this is a very interesting thing because what it points out is that both the revolution on the one hand, secession on the other, and the suppression of secession on the third were all perceived by people in these places as efforts by those already in charge who they, were, they found somewhat oppressive to drag them off into a uh, supposed fight for glory that would simply mean uh, blood and, uh, and terror for them. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I have a curiosity here, and I might have heard this from your census fidelium talk. Um, but how much does, does the desire for manifest? <laughs> I don't just know. Rose up midway through. <laughs> I, have, I have no idea. I think it's probable, but then again, maybe not. Who knows? Who am I to judge? I don't know. <laughs> well, you're Californian. You can't judge, so. That's true. Oh, I oh, like that. Welcome home. <laughs> I didn't welcome leave the home. <laughs> yeah, did you get uh, what I was asking? So I was like, you know, I did you not. You cut off at halfway through manifest. You were about to, I think you were about to say manifest oh. destiny, and then you cut off there. <laughs> yeah, so, um, like, I heard the theory, like, um, that the founding fathers or the influential Americans wanted to break off from England um, so that they could capitalize on the West themselves, that they wouldn't have to share that. Um, that profit with uh, the people in England, they could control it alone. Uh, I would say there's a lot to that. It's not the only thing, but it's not untrue either. There's, um, and, there's, oh, sorry. Well, no, I was just going to say, you know, it's important to bear in mind, one of the things, one of the great myths of the revolution is this whole idea of taxation without representation. And the reason why I call it a myth is that the vast majority of the taxes that the average colonists paid were collected by the colonial assemblies. The colonial assemblies, in turn, were dominated by little local oligarchies, and the majority of uh, white uh, men could not vote for them, but they still mm -hmm. had to pay taxes to them. So, uh, you know, if one were unkind, and of course I'm not, so I won't say this, but if one were unkind, one might have said to them, well, if you'd like taxation without representation, why don't you practice it and show us how it's done? Or non-taxation without representation. You know, have everyone who's paying taxes vote in your assembly, and then we can talk about Parliament. What do you say? I've I have a feeling that would have been a real non-starter. And the proof of the pudding were things like Shays' Rebellion after the Revolution. When uh, that was in 1785, when... Uh, the veteran Captain Daniel Shays led a revolt against the government of Massachusetts because they still had to pay taxes and weren't represented. 
Mm. And they made the mistake of thinking that John Hancock and the gang had meant what they said. <laughs> be careful. When you're going to do propaganda, be careful it does, that people don't take you seriously. Because otherwise, if you win, there's going to be a bill to pay. One of my ancestors was actually jailed for taking part in Chase Rebellion. See? <laughs> See? He should have known better. <laughs> When professional politicians promise you the moon and the stars in return for you giving your blood and treasure, remember they don't mean it. Yeah. Well, no, they mean give them your blood and treasure. That part's sincere. <laughs> that that part is true. I I do have a, a kind of relevant question to all this. So, yeah. uh, as we discussed earlier, so Cromwell, the Parliamentarians, and the Commonwealth died. They diluted into the Whigs, of course, and we know the Jacobites. They diluted into Tories, of course. And now in America, yeah. it sort of related, that sort of translates itself. So you had the the Redcoats, of course, the, the loyalists to the crown who were Tories, of course, and the people who obviously aligned themselves with uh, without a king, of course, they were obviously Whigs, uh, owing to their sort of no taxation about representation, uh, liberal chimes. So my question really here is that Edmund Burke, our one one famous Anglo-conservative philosopher, of course, he was in favor of the American Revolution, owing to his Whig roots, of course. Right. So, is there any way to actually say that perhaps he was misconstrued, or do we have to take on face value that he, as a Whig, is ultimately pro sort of Republican? Well, Burke, I think, as we say in California, he grew as a person. You know, he, he had a certain amount of consciousness raising brought about by the horrors of the French Revolution. There's something about seeing a whole civilized nation bathed in blood that, I don't know, kind of gets to you. So, <laughs> uh, but certainly at the time of the revolution, you know, it was Dr. Johnson, Samuel Johnson, who called him a bottomless wig. And you could get online Johnson's comment on the revolution called Taxation No Tyranny, which I recommend very highly. Uh, but Burke, of course, is cited by American conservatives as being a conservative, which he was in a sense, but only after the French Revolution. Certainly. Um, you'll see examples of this from time to time in history. People who see the results of their own ideas shoved in their faces and suddenly don't like them anymore. Uh, you know, a good example, to be honest with you, were people like, uh, well, all right. <laughs> no, I, I was thinking more of Erasmus and uh, St. Thomas More and a lot of the other Reichland. You know, a lot of the humanists uh, and the immediate, the immediate uh, eve of the Protestant revolt were up front in denouncing the abuses and horrors of the clergy of the time. But then when the revolt started, it's interesting. And, and usually, you know, humanism is seen as a precursor to the Protestant revolt. But what's funny is how even when it would have been to their advantage, as with Erasmus, the vast majority of the first rank of humanists refused to join the revolt. Even when it was to their detriment, like St. Thomas More. Yeah, I was about to say, he's the better example of a person who sacrificed a bit to not join the revolt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, my personal yeah. favorite was the Bishop of uh, Skalholt in Iceland, uh, Jan Arason, who was a terrible man. He had a mistress, he had seven sons, and the Lutheran revolt began in Iceland, and he raised an army to fight it. He was defeated, he was taken prisoner, and he was given a choice. Death for him and his sons, or he could stay as bishop and marry his wife and legitimize his sons. He and his boys all chose death. I think there's another very similar uh, anecdote from a Dutch saint um, as well, where he, it was a very similar story that he was, I think he was a priest instead or a monk, I forget, uh, where he was a very big, um, 
he was a big fornicator and um an adulterer and when the protestants came up to him in the netherlands when the calvinists came up to him and told him like well if you convert we can allow you to continue being a, a fornicator and adulterer and his last words before he died were well fornicator i am heretic i am not <laughs> that's right he was one of the martyrs of gorkum uh in the netherlands and another one of them was a danish capuchin who had come to the netherlands to escape the revolt in denmark Mm. <laughs> I, I actually think that uh, that story about uh, fornicator I was, a uh, heretic I wasn't, is uh, really beautiful. This is a bit off topic, but it reminds me also of the, uh, I believe he was a, he was an Asian saint. Uh, I'm not going to specify a country so as to not make a mistake, but he was a, a severe uh, drug addict, I believe it was, or, or perhaps an alcoholic. But uh, when he, he was given the grace of martyrdom because he suffered so much with his addiction, he felt he couldn't go to confession because he knew that he would instantly fall back into this sin of drug abuse. So he was given the grace of martyrdom. And throughout his sin and his addiction, he still held his faith in Christ. So I thought I'd, I'd interject and mention that as a oh, wonderful is story. The, uh, opium saint. Uh, yes, so opium. Not, that's it. Yes, yes, yes. Not, yes, Chinese. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. well, there, uh, there was a story a friend of mine had told me a while ago. It was about um, a Talleyrand from during the French Revolution, who, in spite of, of course, being probably one of the greatest enemies of church of the church that one could have in the modern day, when he lay dying, um, uh, called for a priest. And uh, mm -hmm. it's rather funny when the priest went to perform <laughs> last rites on him. He was about to perform the anointing on his hands, and uh, he almost performed the anointing of a layman. And in that moment, his immediate response was, do not forget, I am still a bishop. That's right. <laughs> and while he was waiting for the priest, he, kept, he, stood, he was murmuring, just one last treaty, O oh Lord, just one last treaty. <laughs> True story. And, and, you know, the, the funny thing, and this is where... At the end of the day, we're, we all stand sort of aghast at the background of history. Certainly none of these martyrs would ever have happened if things had been sane. You know, you look, you, look at, uh, you look at the French Revolution and people who died for the faith whose lives were, shall we say, a little irregular. Well, the French Revolution was a terrible thing for France, but it turned out being okay for them. Uh, I'm reminded of one of the leaders of the Vendée, I forget which one now, but he was not a nobleman, quite the contrary. And about 1785 or so, he was caught smuggling salt from the Vendée somewhere else. Mm. And so he was tried and convicted and carried <clears throat> the death penalty. Well, it so happened that his mother was, he was an only child, his mother was a widow. So she made her way to Versailles, all the way from the Vendée, she walked there. And she buttonholed Louis XVI of the Gardens of Versailles and told her a story and begged him to pardon her son. So he wrote out a pardon. And she got back as quickly as she could and got her son released. So he, he, he wasn't uh, executed. Well, a few years later, Louis XVI is murdered. The next year, the Vendée Revolt starts. They come to this fellow. And he said, well, I don't think we'll win, but I'll lead you. And he says, well, if you're so sure we're not going to win, why are you doing it? He said, I owe my life to my king. I, mm. I can't do anything but spend it in his, uh, in his service now. And that, you know, gentlemen, see, this is the, the great secret of history. We see these things, the terrible, the horrible developments, but we don't know what they're going to result in. Henry. Mm. And you know, actually, that pretty wonderful anecdote actually provides a very good segue uh, back to the American Revolution in how, you know, how you pointed out that many of the loyalists had also been um, cavaliers and Jacobites. And, you know, for a lot of Jacobites who ended up being loyalists, the reason why they ended up doing it was because they they owed their whole lives to the to King George because he, he was the one who pardoned them and allowed them to settle America, I believe. Um, there was a very famous uh, loyalist, I forget her name, but she basically, I remember she helped 
Bonnie Prince Charlie escaped, and when her family moved to America, they would become they went on to become prominent loyalists. I forget the name. Flora McDonald. That's her. That's right. Hmm. Hmm. She Flora that's McDonald. She was the one who uh, arranged Bonnie Prince Charlie's escape to the Isle of Skye, disguised as her Irish maid. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and she and her husband Alan McDonald uh, emigrated to North Carolina. And they raised the Highlanders for the king, unfortunately being defeated at uh, Moise Creek Bridge and then deported. Similarly, uh, the, um, in the Mohawk Valley of New York uh, in 1776, uh, Sir William Johnson, who'd been the, he was Anglo-Irish, he'd been the, uh, uh, the king's Indian agent for the north. He had uh, settled a bunch of Scots Catholics on his estates in the uh, Mohawk Valley. Well, they were Catholic, and they had an Irish priest, Father um, John McKenna. Well, they were driven out in the winter of 1776 by the rebels, and they had to make the long trek to Montreal in the winter. So a lot of their old people and their children and their uh, women, pregnant women in particular, died on the long march to Montreal. So the men were formed into a regiment, the Royal Highland Emigrants, and then went back to visit their neighbors the following year. <laughs> Not in a nice way. It wasn't really a welcome <laughs> wagon. But <laughs> Father John became their, their military chaplain, and he was the first Catholic chaplain in the British Army since 1688. Uh, mm. Charles, John you Catholic. reminded me. Uh, you reminded me. Uh, actually, I had one of the, the great privileges of my life. Uh, t uh, you mentioned the Vendean War, uh, to stand and admire the flag of Henry de la Rochecla, the flag that was carried by him or by his men into battle. Yes. And it reminded me of something that I think is was something very sad that we've lost, is fighting not for a politician, or this idea of fighting for a politician or fighting for money, but fighting for crown and country. I think it's something that even in the United Kingdom, where we have a monarchy, uh, which God willing will never disappear, um, the sense of fighting for king and country, that idea really has disappeared. And so to be able to stand and look at that blood-stained banner with the bullet holes in, seeing where these men had fought and died and given their life for the cause of not only the crown, but of Holy Mother Church. It's something that really must be restored. And I think it's when there is this God willing, uh, Anglospheric uh, restoration of Christendom and of Catholicism. I truly hope that that idea of fighting for crown and country will also be restored. Well, please God. Mm -hmm. I, um, you know, I, I found out uh, in the past couple of years, I knew that my multiple great-grandfather, Laughlin McKinnon, had come of a Jacobite family on the island of Egg in the Hebrides. Uh, and I knew that his two brothers had died at Culloden. But... Seems Charles is frozen. Oh. Yes, I think the I'm freezing. I'm freezing, uh -oh. yeah. Maybe the ice got him. It's rather funny the, the way it froze. It got him in just the, the worst <laughs> possible place that it could have frozen. <laughs> uh. Just looks shocked. Uh. Yeah. Anyways, oh, you're Charles, back. Oh, you're back. we lost you for about 20 seconds. Yes. Nope, we may have lost him again. Oh, no. Austrian Wi-Fi. Yeah, I was going to say. It's... I thought my rural Ohio Wi-Fi. Um, while we're waiting, I'll get everyone else's opinion. So what is the biggest lie Americans are taught about the American Revolution just in high school, mm -hmm. middle school? I, I suppose oh. that for, in the British perspective, in politics, uh, now we the module conservatism. This is why I brought up Edmund Burke. There's this idea that 
the American Revolution was inherently conservative because it was Americans have sort of oh the conservative oh, sexual liberty and their choices. Oh, Charles is back. Does Charles want to yeah. finish his little segment? Yeah, because you were wow. talking about the island of egg when you cut off. Yeah, the, the fabulous island of egg in the Hebrides. At any rate, quick quick version. Um, we, we thought, as I say, that he had been born in 1738, too young to go to the battle, and came to Canada in 1772. And then his daughter, Geneviève, was smart enough to marry a French-Canadian. Sorry. Anyway, uh, <laughs> the thing is that... Wh what? Anyway, um, I found out a couple of years ago that it was not true. He was born in 1725 and died at the age of 110 and was, in fact, a participant of the battle himself. I read all that in his obituary. Mm, that's wonderful. Mm. Yeah, I was quite yeah. quite excited. I wish my father was were alive. He would have been really mm. overjoyed. Yeah. But at any rate, um, I, I see that we've we've got questions, do we? Yeah. Um, well, well, yeah. Michael put out a very interesting question. It was, uh, "What is the biggest lie that uh, schools have taught about the American Revolution?" We're we're going around in uh, limbo uh, right in now. In America. Uh, in America, yeah. He said, I think he explained it from a British perspective, that it was a conservative revolution. And yes. he, well, here in America as well, they also bring, like, you have a lot of people who bring that up. Um, and definitely, I think I think one of the biggest proponents of that, at least, like, in the conservative camp, is um, Russell Kirk, which I find to be a pretty interesting figure. Uh, as he would basically, you know, he would try to, have a sort of traditional worldview while also trying to argue the glorious revolution and the American Revolution were both conservative revolutions, which I have no clue how that how that works. I think it's um, if you're trying to conserve the system that existed from like the mid 1700s until it collapsed right afterwards. If you're conservative for a very specific slice of history, you might be able to force that to work together. Well, also look at it this way: yesterday's revolutionaries are tomorrow's reactionaries. Mm -hmm. mm. Because they've they've gotten what they wanted, and they want to keep it. So, uh, for the the Whig I mean, look at the Federalists, for example. I'm sorry. Look at the Federalists, for example, in America. Uh, well, yes, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And while uh, the other thing to bear in mind is that the notion that they were conservative revolutions is something that a lot of people like Russell Kirk, who remember. They're trying to establish some kind of continuity between ourselves and our British past. Now, the problem we have, however, is that our revolution was, in fact, liberal. Now, having said that, what does it mean? It means several things. Firstly, it means that what we call liberal, the Europeans and Latin Americans traditionally called socialist. What we call conservative, they called liberal. Think Manchester School, think Bismarck. These were liberals. Think Whig. Oh, we've lost our, our moderator. Yeah, we lost Mike. <laughs> well, now all the civility is going to break down. Everybody's going to be beating each other up. <laughs> but then uh, what they call conservative, which were at least on the continent, uh, on the continent and to a great degree, if you think high Tory, young England, um, these were the anti-revolutionaries. These were the opponents of the French Revolution in England to the Wars of the Three Kingdoms and hiding behind it all, the Protestant Revolt. Hmm. So we were left in a situation where, you know, when you talk about the biggest lie in school, <clears throat> the schools, at least in my time, did not talk about it being a, a conservative revolution. They simply said it was a fight for freedom against tyranny, which in my mind is the big lie. Just as the Glorious Revolution, the Wars of the Three Kingdoms, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the revolutions of 1848, none of these were revolutions against tyranny. What they were 
were the attempts of those who already had a huge chunk of the power to take complete control of it for themselves, using whomever they could mobilize in the name of liberty from the lower classes as their foot soldiers. Mm -hmm. uh, oddly enough, you will see a very good schematic to this in the book 1984 by George Orwell. <laughs> if you remember the book at all, um, the hapless hero, Winston Smith, is given a copy of a book supposedly by the, the evil Emmanuel Goldstein about how the regime works. And it describes revolution in these terms. Um, so I mention all this because um, part of the, the problem with the way the American Revolution has traditionally been viewed, and it was done this way for a purpose, it was done the image of the revolution as sort of a salvific act was created to take the place of the king, to serve as a focus of unity and as the foundation of the American civil religion, which allowed us to function without a king for a long time. Henry? I also think another very big, I think another very interesting lie that is said about the American Revolution is that Everyone who fought in the Patriot plan were inherently Republican, were inherently wanting a Republican system, uh, which actually makes allows me to bring up a topic that I, I've always been very fascinated by, and it's that you know the attempts by a lot of the Patriots to have to install Bonnie Prince Charlie as the uh, the American crown. Um, and even then, he was not only the, not not the only candidate who was considered for the American crown. You had, I'm pretty sure, one of George Bethel's sons was also considered. I forget which one. Um, you also had uh, Prince Henry of Prussia as well. Um, and even some people speculated Washington himself. And however, um, that would have been probably highly unlikely. But I'm pretty sure, like the. Monarchical connections, you know, with the American Revolution, like in the Patriot Camp, I'm pretty sure you elaborated pretty well in your book, Star Spangled Crown, and how, you know, and also the uh, the Royalist, Re not yeah, exactly, the Royalist Revolution also goes into detail about this, about how many of them want to go back to the 1708 settlements, many of the many of the statesmen at the time, which I find to be a very, you know, when I'm discussing with people about uh, the American Revolution, and they're very, like, surprised, you know, that people have, that I have monarchical beliefs, right, and I firmly see myself as an American, as a, and it's not as un-American. Well, I'd like to point out, well, a lot of our founders, like, wanted to have a king, a lot of, that was because the idea of a republic, at, at least in the, amongst American Tories, was almost inconceivable uh, at that point. And so I was wondering if you could shed a bit more light on the whole relationship between Bonnie Prince Charlie and America and the whole dilemma of offering him the crown, since I'm sure you know way more than myself on the topic. Well, it's, it's interesting that although the Jacobites who were living in the colonies tended to be loyalists, Bonnie Prince Charlie himself, uh, remember, after 1746, uh, he tried he once more the so-called Elibank plot in 1751 to retake the throne. And that went absolutely nowhere, although he did get a trip to London out of the deal. So he got to see what he should have conquered five years earlier, six years earlier. But um, he was a very disappointed man, a very bitter man, sadly. Um, and so, when the revolution broke out, he was extremely gratified that his uh, Hanoverian cousin was having difficulty. But when the delegation came from the Continental Congress to offer him the crown, he said he was too old, too sick, and too, uh, you know, too whatever to accept. I cannot help but think that he had some notion that accepting it would have created a whole other world of difficulties for him. Although it would have certainly transformed the entire nature of the war. 
I mean, if the colonies had acclaimed the Stuart king as king, it would have, Lord knows what would have happened at home. It certainly, uh, it certainly, as I say, would have changed the nature of things. Uh, the colonials could have argued that they were fighting for the true king and that George was a usurper. The other thing to bear in mind, too, is that with the exception of Georgia, all of the colonies had been founded under the Stuarts and without any input from Parliament or the government. And that was something, as you rightly point out, was brought up by various people and mentioned in, uh, in uh, uh, the Royalist Revolution. Mm -hmm. Part of the problem for the Loyalists, you see, was that, as is so often the, the, the case with counter-revolutionaries, they didn't really know what they wanted. They weren't organized. Uh, part of the problem with resisting a revolution, as we've seen, well, just in the past 10 years, with the whole trans thing, is that whenever anything happens, the vast majority of people are living their lives. And they may not like it, but they go along because there's no leadership. What's the alternative? What are they going to do? And so before you know it, the rainbow flag flies freely from shore to shore. Uh, or whatever it might be. The point is, even if, if you think back to, through the last few years with COVID, once a revolution captures the levers of power in a given area, it becomes very difficult for its opponents to successfully oppose it. And I think that's a good note to um, transition into a few of your questions here. Uh, so on a lighthearted nature, um, somebody asked, what is your favorite art piece? My favorite art piece, personally? Yeah. Wow, that's a tough one. There are a lot of them, you know, that I'm, I'm really fond of. But I would say, I forget the name of the artist, really, but it's uh, one of the pictures of Ichabod Crane being chased by the Headless Horseman. <laughs> All right, next. Um, ooh, having a little difficulties here, but um, so this isn't a question, but um, Peter from ITI wanted to say hello. Oh, he said tell he knew him back. Could. Yeah. All right, and. Next, what is Charles's thoughts on the veneration of Charles the First? Did he not die in schism? Oh, big that's, topic. That's a very, that's a very. Good yes question. or no? <laughs> we can uh, get out <laughs> of here. Before night time. Before it's before an extremely answer, good question. Big is lovely. I I actually wrote a paper for the Society of King Charles the Martyr on this very issue. Mm. Uh, alongside the one by Father Jean Charroux, uh asking if he was a saint. Uh, but, uh, half a second, uh, asking if he was a saint. And I, uh, I would say, all the evidence that I've seen points to the fact that he considered himself a Catholic. He was certainly in favor of reunion with Rome. He prayed to the Virgin. He prayed to the saints. He let his wife venerate the Tyburn martyrs as martyrs. And if that weren't bad enough, he, um, uh, what's the word I want? Uh, well, uh, he never referred to himself, as you, as you mentioned during the trial, as a Protestant. It, it seems to me that from his side, anyway, uh, his schism was notional. You know, one of the things about schism, this is where it's difficult to gauge often enough. It's rather like those Orthodox saints that uh, Eastern Catholics are allowed to venerate. Technically, they're schismatic because they were in communion with, say, the Patriarchate of Constantinople in 1098. But the church allows Eastern Catholics to venerate them. In the question of Charles I, I can only say um, 
the uh, the ordinariate in America has allowed ordinary members of the society to pray for favors from Charles I as they would any servant of God. If those prayers are ever granted, that'll be a bit of evidence, certainly, that he didn't die in schism. Is, is there, uh, Charles, if, pardon me, uh, I've never actually heard, like, I, I'm not against the veneration of Charles III, so don't uh, see this as an attack. Is there a, a document or a letter regarding that? Because I've never heard of that before. I think that's very interesting. Well, basically, I can tell you, uh, mm, I composed please. the prayer that the uh, society used, and Bishop uh, Bishop Lopesh approved it. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, mm. please please do. Yes. That's it. Uh, not much mm. more I can tell you. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. he, uh, I asked him... Uh, yeah, finish, finish your thought, Charles. Mr. Charles. What's that? Uh, finish your thought, Mr. Kalam. I didn't mean to interrupt you there. No, no, I, I just... Uh, you know, as with any as with any uh, prospective servant of God, we don't know if they're mm. in heaven or not. We pray to them in hopes that they are, and if they come across with miracles, then the church has something to work with. Thanks be to God. Exactly. Mm. Wonderful. And if not, not. <laughs> but, <laughs> mm. So, I mean, we, what we can't do, the Catholic members of the society cannot uh, venerate Charles is a saint mm. because yeah, he's um, because he's not, you know, he's not been canonized by the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. uh, but he's certainly a uh, certainly a better candidate than Martin Luther King Jr. And Lord knows <laughs> there are enough of those Martin Luther King masses. Yes. Okay. So, um, and. I would bet on Charles the First over JFK. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> to, to go back to our original statement, you know, it's like I take I take your King Charles over President Biden any day. Oh. Well, that that's even less controversial. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me tell you something. Do you remember the election in twenty twenty? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, the, the president doesn't. Anyway, what is, the, <laughs> what is the next question, if you please? All right. Um, so this is a good question to end with. Um, how can we begin to honestly start ground level organizing for a Catholic state, for monarchism and Catholic social teaching? Well, I think it would start with the individual. Well, yeah. I mean, basically... You've got to remember that the Catholic state, Catholic monarchy, Catholic social teaching were not created. Well, Catholic monarchy is implicit in, in the kingship of Christ. Might I add, um, I think you also brought this up as well in, in On Off the Menu once, that all Catholic monarchies were not built from the ground up. They were right. built top down, like Clovis, etc., uh, Alfred the Great, etc. They all, all these Catholic states develop from the top to the bottom. So, might I, well, well, that's the same actually, thing with the church. They, they did, they sort of did both. You had a Catholic king come along who converted and converted his people. But you see, that was at a time when you had a people who were relatively homogenous and would go along with their king. Today, it's a bit different. Nothing's homogenous. You know, not to uh, sound mean or cruel, but you may recall all over the Commonwealth the accession proclamations throughout the British Isles, in Canada, Australia, uh, New Zealand, and so forth. You had these very often Republican and atheist politicians come out and proclaim the accession of our dread Lord, <laughs> His Majesty King Charles III. And it was beautiful. Because they used all this religious language and all this monarchical language. And for a matter of minutes, any number of atheist and or Republican mayors and politicos of different kinds suddenly turned to the God-fearing servants of his majesty. <laughs> but it was a little bit like the Renaissance Fair. Uh, mind you, don't get me wrong, I've worked the Renaissance Fair and I'm all for it. That's not my point. Uh, but what is my point is that there has to be a combination of things. 
in other words, yes, we need a leader to establish that kind of thing. So you're, you're right, and I, and I have made this observation. But also, the popular soil has to be right for such a leader. So I would say there are three things that one needs to do. One is evangelize. That's preparing the soil. Evangelize, 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 evangelize. And then when you're finished, evangelize. The second thing is learn about these concepts because they're completely alien to most of us all the time, all of us most of the time. We don't know about this stuff and neither does anybody else. Remember the three things that have not been taught in at least 60 years in most schools across the globe. Civics, history, literature. And those are three things that are the best of our ability in addition to the faith we need to try to master. It's very, very important. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, we have to pray to God very, very strongly that he send us good leaders who will do as Clovis and other such folk did. Uh, you know, I was in um, in England uh, this past week uh, weekend, and then before uh, I came home Easter Monday, Easter Sunday at St. Bede's Clapham, they chanted the prayer for the king after uh, High Mass on Sunday, the extended Wonderful. Jacobite version, incidentally. And then uh, at the Birmingham Oratory this past Sunday, at the end of Mass, they sang God Save the King, two verses. Wonderful. They, they left oh. out, oh, Lord, our God, arise, which, you know, would have been nice, but never mind. <laughs> uh, but pray for the king. Amen. Pray for all kings, whether hey, right. reigning or not. Pray oh, that right. pray that the heirs to the various royal houses, mm. whether they be... Well, today, today, especially, Charles, is the birthday of a man who I've had the pleasure of meeting, uh, Louis the Twentieth, the rightful king of France, and is the Duke it? of oh, Anjou. Really? Today well, is his oh, birthday. Ironic, isn't it? Because we're supposed to oh, do this it? Very and, good. Then it, and then we end up doing his day, the birthday of a king. <laughs> Vive le roi très chrétien. Indeed. <laughs> oui. And that <laughs> it's, uh, pray for pray for all these folk that they are able to live up to their vocations. Pray mm. that they have children who are willing to. Quite and right. for those of us who find ourselves in a position to aid such, if as, if as and when the time should come, praise God that we have both the opportunity and the fortitude to do so. Of course. I would love to see it in my time. I'd, I'd love you to see it in your time. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's my advice, such as it is. So I think that's a really good place to end at. Um... Do you have any books you would like to uh, give a shout out to, uh, Mr. Colum? Like, oh, some book for anyone who sees this. Well, this the Star Spangled Crown. Keeping an active list of the ones you mentioned while we've been here. Yeah. <laughs> the Star Spangled Crown. I'd also recommend Thomas Molnar's The Counter Revolution, which is available on, online uh, at the fabulous, uh, what do you call it, archive.org. Um, Two of my own books I don't mind recommending strongly. One is Blessed Emperor Carl, mm. Legacy of Only One Emperor. second. Uh oh. <laughs> He's got the whole section. There it is. Uh, and, then he, and then he freezes. My enemies. Uh, no, <laughs> enemies. <laughs> I was going to say, you froze. I was going to say, my enemies have done this. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't see the walk. It, it was so strategic. Did you, did you actually lift it up? Yeah, no, you yeah. It. Yeah, you did. it froze when you did. There we it's go. It's a beautiful look. I think we've seen it, but it froze for you, so that's kind of a coincidence. <laughs> there, you go. There, there you go. If I'm not mistaken, yeah. Mr. Coulomb, you also have a book on Emperor Zeta and uh, Otto in the works as well, if I'm not mistaken. I, I do indeed. I have to finish some this summer. I've uh, Because of my prolonged illness, my uh, publishers for both books have been very forgiving. But they've got to be done by the 1st of September, and done they shall be. Uh, I would also recommend my own book on the Holy Grail, A Catholic Quest for the Holy Grail. Yes, Not I'm that we're pushing my stuff, but, you know. <laughs>
<laughs> I have a writer by trade. Yeah. <laughs> I believe we have a discount code with Tan, and I think they published one or two of your books, didn't they? Yeah. Yes, they, they published, well, both uh, Emperor Carl and uh, the Holy Grail. Let me play and, the other uh, oh, Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Charles. I keep interrupting you. This has been like so third I, time. It's your show. You can do what you like. I don't <laughs> care. Uh, I would just say, though, that both uh, the Emperor Carl book and the uh, Grail book with the brain children of my late lamented editor at TAN, uh, Mr. John Morehouse, who died at the age of 51 very suddenly. Um, so please uh, keep John in the repose of his soul in your prayers. He left mm -hmm. a wife and young children behind. Um, mm -hmm. It was a really, I had worked for him for years before he went to TAN uh, and other things. Uh, oh man, God bless his soul. Please God, he was a good man. Anyway, well, keep the faith, gentlemen. And remember, <laughs> it's only as horrible as it looks. No. Hold on. I, I, can, I can do this. Uh, it's it's positive, thinking. positive thinking is the key to self-deception. No, that's not it either. <laughs> <laughs> it's always darkest before it collapses. No. <laughs> no, gentlemen, I, I, I've got to give you something something hopeful to leave on. Uh, oh, and I have it. Are you ready? Go on, son. All that is gold is not glitter. Not all those who wander are lost. The old that is strong does not wither. Deep roots are not touched by the frost. From the ashes a fire shall waken. From the shadows a light shall spring. We made the blade that was broken. The crownless again shall be king. Yeah. Lovely, all men. Here we are. Jolly so, good. Um, Lovely. Yeah. I say we just end there. No one talk. No one um, <laughs> go after that. All um, right, good gentles. Well, let me wish you all a very fond good night. I've got uh, another thing I've got to attend to, and then I've got another podcast to do this evening. So. Yeah. Thank you. God Are you doing a um, doing God off the menu you. today? Uh, not tonight. Off the menu will be Saturday. This is for the never-ending struggle for Virgin Most Powerful Radio, and you'll be happy to know tonight's episode, which will be shown, I guess, I think Monday, is yeah. Anatomy of a Coronation. Lovely. Oh, brilliant! Oh, brilliant. Oh, brilliant. Virgin Most Powerful VMPR dot org. Hmm. Uh, I, uh, yeah, for um, any of our viewers, we have another show in about three hours. Um, Emily Meitzner, she's a choir director. Um, she knows a lot about sacred music, so tune back in for that. Um, <laughs> and you can wonderful. catch me Monday also on uh, Off the Menu, which is resuming after my delightful Easter break. Of course. God bless. Definitely. So God bless you all. And take care. All right. God, God bless, bless you. Bye-bye. Are you looking for some more books to read? Receive 15% off your TAN books order when you use the code Catholicism for the Modern World. And be sure to check out the $5 April book sale.